Hi everyone, officially live, it's one o'clock. Just to start the thing, it's like that little um, take one situation <laughs> from old movie making. Let's just wait a little bit for people to join. Hi April, I see that you've joined. Remember, April, if you have any questions, just go ahead and shoot them across the chat. I'll do my best to pay attention to them as I'm going through the topic today. So I'm going to start with writing some things on the terrestrial whiteboard to kind of set up the, the structure of the topic today, which is, I'm hoping to do this. Um, oh, great, that fits. Awesome. Hi, April, I saw your question, why is my libido waning? You know, this is a very common observation slash complaint that women have at midlife. It's very, and it is a very complicated answer, but we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we talk about the kind of emotional and psychological changes that happen uh, with menopause. Great, so we're starting here. First of all, Let's start with kind of structuring um, the talk today. So we want to combine the topic, combine two topics that are really quite taboo, right? One is menopause, which is short for MP. Uh, one is menopause, and we know kind of the challenges of the status quo around talking about menopause and how it limits women's understanding and their ability to manage, control, and take charge of what's happening during the transition. And also then sex. It's, you know, we've by now have had some experience with sex in our lives and we understand how menopause changes affects how we're dealing with sex. So I'm going to add this, which is the second topic, sex. Right? And it also has physiological change, effects, aspects, emotional aspects, psychological aspects, and then overall kind of how it ties with life. And so those two, they all, because menopause and sex are so complex, it's important to kind of break them down in different facets. So the first thing I want to do is talk about menopause changes from a physiological perspective. Those tend to be the most biggest complaint when we talk about having an active sex life. Actually, let me step back and, and talk about one point regarding sex. So we think about sex, and the question is, what do you think about when you hear the word sex, and then menopause plus sex? Often it's the frequency of having sex. Is sex just intercourse to you? Is it um, an understanding that you have a sex life? There's sexual identity, sexual expression, sexual health, and underneath that, sexual functioning. And all of that is in the milieu of sex. And I'm just going to use the term sex kind of to capture them all, and we'll talk about different components of what that means. So in terms of menopause and the physiology, the biggest change for menopause under physical is urogenital. And it's kind of the geeky way to talk about changes to the urinary tract system, uh, bladder control, and genitals. So let's talk about the urinary tract. All of this is affected by the fluctuations of estrogen and ultimately the decline of estrogen over time. Uh, the urinary tract tissues as well as vaginal tissues and uh, your vulva are uh, nourished by estrogen. So when estrogen starts to fluctuate and go away, there can be a uh, great impact. Uh, so first, in urogenital, we can talk about incontinence and uh, urgency. And those two things are prevalent symptoms 
they happen. And again, of course, all women will experience this differently, but it's in the set of symptoms that arise. And with uh, urogenital issues, if you can imagine having intercourse, that it's kind of hard to relax if you think you're going to pee a little bit. So that can impact intercourse. The other thing is kind of the more prevailing symptom set, and that is <laughs> squeaky, squeaky, and that is vaginal issues. And we talk about things like, I'm sure you've heard, like vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy. Uh, again, estrogen is really important to the tone of the vaginal muscles. So when it starts to wane, the vaginal tissues and the tone start to kind of deteriorate. It's a horrible thing to say about your vagina, but that's kind of the, how it's being described. And I'll just take kind of a little um, screw the patriarchy stance right here, right now, is that if we could all come up with a better term than vaginal atrophy and vaginal dryness, uh, I implore us to do so. And I use the comparison on erectile dysfunction. So now we just refer to ED and everyone's fine. Nobody says this man suffers from mushy penis. Right, so I don't think we should have to say, like, I have a dry vagina or my vagina is atrophying. So if we could figure out another phrase, like, let's just do that because it's kind of bullshit. So that's my little, like, soapbox position. Going back to vaginal issues. So they range from kind of itchy dryness, just kind of feels uncomfortable, to not being able to take any penetration that it's so bad. Again, your vagina is a muscle. muscle. Its tone is kind of where it's happy place, it's strong, it's responsive. And when the estrogen wanes, it starts to lose tonacity. The vagina walls actually kind of collapse a little bit. I know, these descriptions are not great. Um, but this affects the part of sex, which is sexual functioning, right? How does your vagina feel? Are you comfortable? Does it feel pleasant and pleasurable? Like, this is important. So that's what have those are the main things from a physiological perspective. Break into how we kind of uh, options to address those after we go through the other things. From an emotional perspective, right, we've got mood swings that are, we talked about anxiety a couple of sessions ago, depression, stress, and anger. All of those things like influence right, our ability and our desire and our ability to be present during a sexual activity, our desire to start into a sexual activity. It's all really important. And then you have the psychology, right? So the psychology and the emotions kind of tie into each other. What does it mean to me? How do I feel about myself today or in this transition of my life? How do I compare to who I was and who do I want to be? And then that falls into life overall. So I kind of break it down between these two things, which is kind of the physical side and everything else. So let's go a little bit deeper. And I actually would put this into kind of a lump it all together into libido, which is... Um, April, your question, right? So libido is part emotion, part physical, but psychological, and like how do you fit in your life sometimes to have really pleasurable and satisfying sex life? Okay, so that's where we are in the, the split of the two. Um, when it comes to treatments, we'll talk, it's mostly a function of estrogen when it comes to really uh, discomfort and pain. Um, for your vagina. So this is a function of estrogen. And there are, and I'll talk about estrogen, there are three ways that, uh, that estrogen is prescribed. One is orally, so you can take pills. Two is topically, so there are patches or creams that you can use. And then finally is locally, so insertions in the vagina for localized estrogen. As I understand it, I want to share with you is that they, they all have different impacts to your system. So when you take oral estrogen, it's meant to be in your blood. It takes a long time through the digestive system to get to you and through the liver to get through to your blood. So you actually have to take a fair high dose of estrogen. When it's done transdermally, the dose can be lower and it gets into the bloodstream faster and a lower rate but stays longer. So in some ways, it's a lot more less intrusive but much more effective because it's low dose and longer exposure in the blood. Estrogen locally, so estrogen um, suppositories or estrogen 
uh, low, uh, slow release rings in vagina are known to relieve vaginal discomfort very quickly and readily, and uh, women are quite satisfied with it. What is understood about local estrogen therapy is that it doesn't impact estrogen levels in the blood. Well, it may, but only to a little bit. So it's not as, as risky, if you will, or impactful as doing oral estrogen. So you get the benefit of having estrogen infusing the tissues of the vagina, making them healthy, having tone, keeping shape, and you don't have that extra risk of having um, excess estrogen in the bloodstream. So that's uh, we have for estrogen therapy for vaginal problems. The other things to think about are um, moisturizers, And there are two kind of aspects to that. One is just for relief. So things like hyaluronic acid or coconut oil, just to relieve some discomfort. So that's one. The other is moisturizers to deal with um, tissue atrophy. Similar to estrogen, you can find uh, non-hormonal natural um, products that will address discomfort in the vaginal tissues. So that's really important to understand what you, what's happening and what you can do about it. So that's the kind of the physical side. So let's jump to the emotional, psychological, and like the life side. And this is where it gets really complex because we're often jumping back and forth from like, I'm not in the mood, not feeling like it. There's so much stress in my life. I can't even like, I don't even, my body's changing so much. I don't even feel really sexy right now. So like, what am I supposed to do? And we push it to the side. And I think this is a very common occurrence and it's a shame, it's a disgrace. Even the WHO, World, or World Health Organization, has identified that sexual health is a human right. And in our complex lives as modern women, we, we very often are like, ugh, later. It's not that important. But in fact, it's hugely important. And I believe, particularly at midlife, when there's so many changes, and we're trying to figure like, where, how do we get through this and where are we going to go? What does that mean for us as sexual beings? This is an important thing to explore. And so that's uh, part, really the reason why I'm doing this session is to talk about physiological symptoms of of menopause and how it impacts sexual function and then the emotional side and how it impacts kind of the expression and the desire around having sex. And again, sex in that broad sense of like playfulness, physical intimacy, um, arousal and pleasure. So what are those things? What do they mean to us? And again, it's super hard because libido wanes. And this is in my view and a lot of um, Discussion around life. In midlife, in our 40s and 50s, in some levels, we're very aware of ourselves and we are excited to be mature. Out of our 20s and our 30s, we're probably at the peak of our careers, making good money and kind of satisfied with who we are. And then we hit the changes of menopause and it pushes against our identities as women. Uh, what does youth mean to us? Who are we going to be as older women? And how does that impact sexuality? And that is a big complex thing that none of us can answer for each anyone else, but we should frame it in ways that we can dig down in, in these aspects that are important to us. So you think about mood, again, anxiety, depression, stress, and anger, all of those things arise. They get exacerbated by the emotional fluctuations of menopause, but also exacerbated by life. In midlife, you have parents that might be sick, or you're empty nesters, or you, you're questioning your primary love relationship, or you thought you were at your peak of career, and then like they fire you. So like all this tumult around this stage of life, plus the hor hormonal changes, really pushes us. So the moods are always there. Right? And then again, we kind of forsake it, which I think like, oh, I do it too. So if we could just commit ourselves to exploring this ourselves as sexual beings at midlife, my belief is that we're going to be like amazing, cool, badass, and really satisfied elder women. <laughs> okay, so 
thinking about this is libido. I, I think that a very common occurrence when libido wanes is like, ah, oh, shit, here I am. Like, I'm never going to get it back. And like, oh, who cares? You know, like, what am I going to do? And then it becomes this massive hurdle that we have to jump over. Next time I have sex, it's got to be super satisfying, mind-blowing, because then it verifies and validates that I'm a sexual being and I can orgasm. When in fact, like, it's just, it's kind of a slow go. And what I am tuning into lately on this topic is the sense of desire and pleasure and joy and thinking about us first, what it means to us as we pursue pleasure. Where do, where do the, the seeds of desire come from? And how do I light myself up first so that I can't have these things, right? It's not relying on my partner or my vibrator. It's like, what do I want? What do I want to feel? And I think we, in our daily lives and complex women, this stuff kind of gets pushed to the side. And this is really critical. I was listening to a podcast recently and they said, you know, just stop. If you haven't had sex in a while and you don't feel really desirous, or your libido is down, you think like, just stop and think of those times where something really kind of lit you up. You got all tingly inside. And maybe it was you were reading something, you saw a picture, or your partner did something that was kind of sexy. You're like, ooh, okay, that. And tune into just that and see where that can take you. Instead of like, oh my God, okay, we got to get naked, we got to get in bed, like, are you going to get hard and are we going to have great sex? Like, it's too much for anyone, for everyone involved, that is just too much. So really tuning in again on this side, we are super complex, like how we feel emotionally, psycho psychologically, what's going on in our lives, um, and how we can be sexual beings in that. And I think it takes dedicated effort and real uh, time commitment to figure it out, spend time there. And that may just lead to a lot of alone time to figure out, like, turn on your own pleasure. Yeah, you know, like, figure it out and really enjoy it. Like, take half an hour, 20 minutes, seven minutes, whatever it takes, just by yourself to really feel that for yourself. First, tune yourself back into that so that you can then share that with someone else or feel further expressed in who you are. I want to touch on a point from the other day when I talked about anxiety. And anxiety, rather, the technique to address anxiety, which is nasal breathing and triggering the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve, again, is the one that's tied to your parasympathetic nervous system. When you stimulate this nerve, it moves your body into rest and restore, out of flight and fight, and into flight and fight, and into rest and restore. The vagus nerve is also tied to the clitoris, which makes, if you think about it, a lot of sense. In order for us, actually, we've had this experience of like kind of mental, like some clitoral stimulation, whether yourself or someone else, it's just like not getting there because we're not fully relaxed. And so, if your vagus nerve connected to your clitoris is like in that space of rest and restoration, then your clitoris can be super happy, right? And then, like, here comes the pleasure. So, thinking about that is another reason to breathe, another reason to stay into rest and restore, right? To to get the body in that place where it can receive and understand and experience pleasure. One thing I'll just note as a fun fact, it's interesting I just read, is that the vagus nerve um, is not going through the spinal uh, cord, which are most major nerves do. So that if a woman were to unfortunately have a spinal cord injury and everything else was severed, she would still be able to have a clitoral, clitoral orgasm which is kind of interesting, which makes me think it's like a much bigger priority than anything else in the body. So that's the clitoris. Um, I want to talk about just a couple more minutes, we're pushing up onto 19 minutes now, about some resources to think about. Um, there is, of course, Esther Perel. Hold on, I just dropped my notes. There's, of course, Esther Perel, who talks about desire talks about maintaining desire in long-term relationships and her sense of eroticism. And eroticism, not unlike erotica, just, just scintillation, but eroticism in that sense of like the essence of life, like what turns you on and gets you excited and like gets literally the juices flowing. So Esther Perel is great. There's um, Mama Gina, who had a school of womanly arts who's all about reclaiming 
pleasure, desire, and joy, and through that reclaiming power. She has a book called Pussy, a Reclamation. I highly recommend it to every single woman on this planet. Like It will change your entire perspective of who you are in your relationship to your pussy. Uh, the other is I recommend there's a vibrator, there's a new clitoral stimulation that's air pulse technology. So instead of full vibration, like that big Hitachi wand thing, um, which can also be good, there's this air pulse technology. There's a company called The Satisfier and another company called Womanizer, which is a very unique and, and I will tell you, a very pleasurable experience uh, using this toy. And then I will dig up this information. I don't know the name of it. There's an app that's designed of erotica, designed just for women. And it's, as I understand it, kind of, you can kind of slightly choose where the, erot the story will go, which I think is kind of cool. So in all of that, I'll just wrap up here. That, oh, just, oh yeah. Yeah, the one thing about sex after menopause is you don't have to worry about pre being pregnant. Thank God. And you have sex anytime because you're not having your period even better. Uh, so I'll wrap up here that menopause is a big deal. It's complex, right? The physiological aspects affect your sexual functioning and we can address, and that, those are addressable with treatments. The other side is like your, is your libido and that's something that we individually have to dive into to understand, right? Why it's important to us to have sexual connection. What is bringing me desire, joy, pleasure? Can I just legitimately fully allow myself in that space? And then how does that um, influence me as a full sexual being as I'm aging, as I'm cultivating this new identity for myself? So that's what I have for you today. I hope that that was helpful. If you have any questions, please do um, email at hello at mightymenopause.com. If, or you can um, add to the post once it's up. And next week, I'm gonna talk about Formula 4-5 and the herbs that are in that formula and how they affect perimenopause symptoms. So until then, I hope this information was helpful and uh, I, I encourage you to go find some pleasure, satisfaction, some desire uh, until we see you again. All right, have a wonderful week and take care, bye.